outside. Donuts in the back and coffee. Um, and then on we have Bible studies on Thursday night on Zoom. So if you're interested in that, it starts at 6.30. And Pastor Chris is teaching through Colossians. So we can send you the, uh, the Zoom link if you'd like. And then we have Friday night. Zoom links on the handout, even better. And we have Friday night. Um, young adult study where we're going right now we're going through the deity of Jesus and uh, should go for another two weeks three weeks depending on how many questions <laughs> pop up how many topics we can kind of you know go off on um, I think that's it, I think that's it. Yeah. yeah yeah thank you everyone for who came out early to help set up we really appreciate that uh, all right I'll open up us Again, will open us up in prayer. Thank you, Lord, that we could gather um, in your name, um, and just whatever distractions we have, Lord, that we would we would consider them and think about how uh, they're distracting us from worshiping you, Lord. Then, in where we're not giving our all to you, all of our heart and mind and soul and strength, and bless bless Pastor Brett, and open our hearts and our minds to receive. Uh, your message that we could uh, be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Scott. It is cool in there. It feels good. So if you guys start overheating, there's waters on the table. There's coffee. That, I hear if you drink coffee, it cools you off. Is that true? No, probably not. <laughs> Dave said yes. All right. You know what? We're going to finish the book of Philippians today. And I have been praying about what book to jump into next, and the Holy Spirit hasn't given me anything yet. So uh, be praying about what book God really wants us to dive deep into. You know, in Philippians chapter 4, starting at verse 13, we ended last week's uh, sermon with this verse, and it's, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Folks, whatever challenges you're facing in life, you have a helper, the Holy Spirit, that gives power and strength and peace to help you through any challenge, any difficulty, any storm. But today we're going to finish this amazing journey that we've had through the book of Philippians. So if you have your Bibles, uh, turn to Philippians chapter 4. We made it to verse 14. And it says this, Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. You yourselves know, Philippians, that the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Remember, Paul wrote this book from a Roman prison. He was probably under house arrest about 61 AD. In the, in the next year or year and a half, Nero began to kill Christians uh, like crazy. He hated Christians. Nero was the emperor during this time. This was the first church on European continent. So the church at Philippi was the first European church, which is kind of interesting. And remember that Philippi was very rich. It was a luxurious city where dignitaries would vacation and oftentimes retire. You can read about the mission trip that Paul and Timothy uh, did in Acts chapter 16. And remember, the first convert there was who? Who remembers? Lydia, she was a seller of purple garments, and she wasn't even from there. She had a house there, and she would sell her luxurious garments there, and she was the, one of the first uh, converts. The next one was the Philippian jailer. Remember, Paul was arrested. At midnight, he started singing praises to God, and his shackles fell off, and the jailer came to know the Lord and his whole family. This was a refined and sophisticated culture. They had banks, they had libraries, they had universities, theater performances, professional athletes. In fact, they have everything that we have except technology. The people who made up the Church of Philippi were professionals, elites, they were rich. Their theater seated 50,000 people. Wow, that's a big theater. 
You know, Philippi was a lot like Orange County. <laughs> I don't even know if we have a theater that seats 50,000, do we? No, I don't think so. Wow, man. Philippians chapter 4, verse 15 again. Philippi was the only church supporting Paul on his mission trips. And it says this again, you yourselves know also, Philippians, that the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. You know, I think about that, that the church of Philippi, had they not supported Paul, he would have to keep making tents and probably his ministry wouldn't have been as rich and prosperous and blessed as it was. You know, that's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is giving. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 5, if you remember, Paul said, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now, and that participation was the giving of the tithes and offerings to help Paul in his ministry. In fact, we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, starting at verse 1, now brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God, which has been given to the churches of Macedonia, which Philippi was the chief church in Macedonia, that in the great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in support of the saints and in support of the ministry. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 8, Paul said, I robbed other churches by taking wages from them to serve you. So the church of Corinth wasn't even supporting Paul. Verse 9 of 2 Corinthians 11, and when I was present with you, I was in need. I was not a burden to anyone. For when the brethren came from Macedonia, Philippi, they fully supplied all my needs. And in everything, I kept myself from being a burden to you and will continue to do so. So back to our text, Philippians 4.17. Paul said, not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek the profit or fruit which increases to your account. You know, when we support missionaries, when we pay tithes at church, you participate in all the ministry the pastors are doing or the missionaries are doing, and somehow it's attributed to your account in heaven. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 19, do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Folks, our greatest treasure has to be looking forward to heaven. The hope of heaven, I mean, it so far surpasses anything that this life can offer. You know, we talked about the new Jerusalem, the city we're going to spend eternity in. The King James, you know, Jesus said, in my father's house, hi guys, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go and prepare a place for you. And God's house, remember, is the new Jerusalem, 1,500 miles long, wide, and high. Remember, we did the calculation. That would be enough room to house every Christian that has ever lived, and they would all get about 600,000 acres if you do a 20-foot ceiling and do levels in the New Jerusalem. Think about that. You know, I would love to have two acres. I, I, I would be blessed with an acre. Living in a condo, you know, we got people all around us, and even my patio doesn't belong to me. It's exclusive use that I can use, but it belongs to the association. But man, for eternity in the new Jerusalem that will settle on the new earth, only Christians will live there, and we're going to get 600,000 acres each. I don't know what we'll do with it, but we're going to have eternity to do. Russ is going to build stuff. Yeah, I, I, I know that. But <laughs> and Bob's going to make a motocross track, so I'll be visiting him quite often. 
Yeah. Uh, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, and um, this is one of those promises where God says, test me in this. And it says, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me, but you say, how have I robbed you? In the tithes and offerings, you are cursed with a curse. You are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing until it overflows. You know, the church of Philippi, Paul ends his letter with that gratitude. You're the only church that supported me as I went on all these missions trips and did ministry. In Proverbs chapter 3, and you can turn there if you'd like. We're going to read several verses. Starting at verse 3, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 3. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Oh, bind them around your neck and write them on the tablet of your heart so that you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and I love this, he will make your path straight, or he will direct your path. Man, I love that God has a plan and a purpose for our life. It's no accident that we're all gathered here at Living Water because God brings people to specific churches for a season to be equipped, to be encouraged, and to be sent out. And this is ascending church. We have sent out many pastors, many worship teams and worship leaders. Uh, uh, Brandon Munchow, who is Rick Munchow's son, uh, cut his teeth in leading worship at our church for like a year and a half. I loved it, and now he's doing well at, a, I think, a Presbyterian church here in Laguna Hills. Man, he's doing great. This church has sent out so many missionaries and worship leaders and pastors all over. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Verse 7 of Proverbs chapter 3, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, and by the way, as we talked about during worship, we don't fear anything but God himself. We don't fear a diagnosis of cancer. Man, if we get that, we trust the Lord. He's going to hold us. We don't fear COVID. We don't fear men. We don't. Uh, I do fear mountain lions. <laughs> uh, but that's a godly fear. That's okay. Uh, verse 8, Proverbs chapter 3. It will be healing to your body. Oh, what will be healing? Don't be wise in your own eyes, verse 7, but fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Why? Because it will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord from your wealth, from the first of all your produce, so that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Back to our text, verse 18. I can't believe we're going to finish Philippians today. Some of you probably thought, okay, usually we do three verses, and then you still miss a lot of your notes in doing it, but we're going to finish the book. Philippians 4.18. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing, to God. I love that, you know, we don't have to go to the temple and sacrifice bulls or rams or sheep for our sins. Christ paid for it all. But as royal priests, we still offer sacrifices. And we talked about this a few weeks ago. One is the sacrifice of love. In loving the unlovable, that's a sacrifice. In giving of your tithes and offerings, that's a sacrifice, a fragrant aroma acceptable to the Lord. And it's well-pleasing to God. Verse 19. I love this. And I printed this on your handout. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Whatever need you have, financial, physical, spiritual, emotional, mental, relational, 
any need that you have, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and we'll read the verse in a minute, all your needs will be met. Verse 20 of Philippians 4. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen or amen, and that means let it be so. In Matthew 6.30, Jesus said, But if God clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all your needs will be met. All these things will be added unto you. You know, you can't outgive God. Yeah, early on in ministry, I thought, well, you know, uh, I'm a youth pastor, so I don't have to pay tithes anymore because I'm a pastor. <laughs> And I remember how I struggled financially. And in fact, a lot of areas of my life. And the Holy Spirit was like, listen, listen, dude, that's, that's mine. You know? <laughs> and so I began to start giving tithes and offerings, and I never worried about finances again. You can't outgive God. Mark chapter 10, verse 27 Looking at them, Jesus said, with people it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. What did he say just prior to that? Oh, it's difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's as difficult as a camel going through an eye of a needle. When pigs fly, when hell freezes over, that's how hard it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because we put our faith in our finances rather than God. We put our faith in our bank account rather than building treasure in heaven. He goes on to say, verse 28, Peter began to say to him, Behold, we've left everything to follow you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and the gospel's sake but that he will receive, note this, a hundred times as much now in this present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions. Don't you love that parenthetical? <laughs> now, this isn't name it and claim it theology, but this is the idea that you can't outgive God. It, it's the same as you pour your life into people around you. The more you pour into others, the more God pours into you. The, the more you give, the more God blesses. It's a, a principle throughout Scripture. Oh, you're going to get it all back along with persecutions. Okay, you're going to be persecuted. And in the age to come, eternal life. And that brings us to the end of the letter. Philippians chapter 4, verse 21. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you. I love this, especially those of Caesar's household. Who was emperor during this time? Nero. Nero was going to kill Christians. And by the way, Nero became a real jerk. When his mom passed away, Nero's mom, he divorced his wife he had a public marriage ceremony to marry a man, all right? So, so all the way back then, you know the Bible is written in chiastic form. It is Hebrew poetry. And there's always bookends. The beginning goes with the end. The next goes with the second to the next, and, and so and so. And as the church was in the beginning, so the church will be in the last days. The church was persecuted. Jesus said, you'll be hated by all nations on account of my name. Even Caesar's household, some of his relatives came to the Lord. Verse 23, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And that ends the letter 
to, to the Philippians. All right, so how did Caesar's family hear the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, it says, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Remember, he was under house arrest in Rome. So that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and everyone else. Now, the Praetorian Guard are exactly like our secret service who guard the president and his family. The Praetorian Guard were a hand-picked group of elite soldiers from the Roman army who served as bodyguards to the emperor and his family. They were first established about 25 BC. Uh, they were like the secret police as well, and they were feared by both the Roman Senate and all the people. These were elite. Under Nero, they began to get paid a lot of money probably to keep their loyalty. In fact, he paid them three times the salary that a typical Roman soldier would earn. Nero reigned about 54 AD to 68 AD. Remember, Paul wrote this about 61 AD, right before Nero was going to start killing Christians. And then he burnt down a lot of Rome, and he blamed it on the Christians so that the Senate would support his killing Christians. Nero would do horrible things to the believers. He would throw these wild parties and orgies, and he would wrap believers in leather and put them up on a pole and burn them to give light to those that went to the party. Philippians 4.21 Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. I love it that Caesar had an opportunity to give his heart to Jesus Christ, but he failed. But many of his household didn't. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Paul ended almost every letter that he wrote with grace be unto you. He began almost every letter with what? Grace and peace be multiplied to you. Or words like that. Those were the two greetings in that, that time. The Hebrew greeting was shalom or peace. And the Greek greeting was charis or grace, unmerited favor. Literally, that unmerited favor has the idea of complete joy fullness of joy to you. Remember Philippians, the theme of the letter was joy. Count it all joy, brethren. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Be filled with grace. Be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. You may have had a rough week or a rough year. I want you to know that as Paul ends all his letters with be filled with joy, be filled with the joy of the Lord, we can run to God for comfort. This morning, God wants all of us to run to him, to enter a season of refreshing from him, to have a fresh start and a new beginning. Remember Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, we covered a couple weeks ago. Don't be anxious for anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I don't know about you, but I need that peace. I need that charis, that grace, that joy that comes from the Lord. There's too many believers that are downtrodden and depressed and anxious when we should be filled with celebrant joy by the power of the Holy Spirit. In John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, and neither be afraid. To get that peace, we run to the Lord. In Acts chapter 3, verse 19, it says, Therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away 
in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. You know, we're about to enter the days of awe. On your handout, if you flip it over to the front, you see at the bottom, oh no, it's on the back actually. <laughs> at the bottom, I have the fall feast listed. Uh, coming up this week, the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, is going to begin. You know, every feast points to a New Testament theological truth. The Feast of Trumpets, if you remember, points to the rapture of the church. Rosh Hashanah, or the Feast of Trumpets, is the only feast that's called the hidden feast that no one knows the day or the hour. It's the only feast that begins with a new moon. Okay, So what they do is they would have watchmen with shofars, trumpets, and they would watch when that first little crescent appeared, that's when the feast would begin. And note this, they would blow the trumpet, and wherever you were, you would leave your work in the field, or if you're sleeping, you would wake up, and you would go to the temple for a holy convocation, almost like the rapture. That last trump. That's why Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour. That was a phrase used by Jews to describe this feast because they didn't know exactly what day it would be. So they celebrate the feast two days because they weren't sure exactly when they would see just that faint crescent of the new moon. It was a religious event that involved festivities, repentance, and contemplation. How have I lived my life this past year? It, it was a precursor to Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. And then after Yom Kippur is the Feast of Tabernacles, or Sukkot, where they would camp and have like a family campground <laughs> and go out camping for seven days, eight days, really. This feast, though, uh, Rosh Hashanah, was the feast to prepare the nation for the coming of Messiah. In fact, most Orthodox Jews believe Messiah will come during this feast. Now, it's interesting, the world is pretty crazy right now. We know that Orthodox Jews rejected Christ. Many of them, many of the Pharisees believed and became part of the first church. But they're looking for Messiah to come during this feast. Man, keep your eyes on Israel this week. <laughs> uh, who knows what could happen? The shofar, the ram's horn, is blown several times during this feast. Most likely, Jesus was born during this feast. And we'll talk about how we get to that timing in December uh, when we talk about uh, the incarnation, Christ coming to the uh, earth. So all the feasts, uh, and if you want a copy of this, I can email it to you. So just email me. My email is on this handout. But Passover pointed to Christ's death. Unleavened bread uh, pointed to Christ's burial. First fruits pointed to Christ's resurrection. Pentecost was the birth of the church. Trumpets, or Rosh Hashanah, points to the rapture. Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, points to the wrath and second coming of Christ when he atones for the earth and the earth becomes a paradise again and the lion lays down with the lamb and the children uh, play at the cobra's den. Yom Kippur uh, points to the second, oh, I already did that. Tabernacles, the seventh feast, points to the millennial reign. In fact, it's a, a feast that everyone who makes it to the millennial reign of Christ will have to celebrate. And the Bible says if they don't celebrate this feast, they won't get rain for the whole next year. And Hanukkah, the Feast of Lights or Dedication, points to our eternal state in the New Jerusalem. This week, as Rosh Hashanah is coming up, I would encourage all of us to examine ourselves. Are we living our lives in a manner pleasing to the Lord? Are we living in our lives in a way that brings glory and honor to God? If you are, 
You have the blessings of God on your life. Hold on one second. I got to end this. I don't have to end it. Let's worship.
this week with Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, coming up. I pray that we would just all examine ourselves. Get on that narrow path if you're off it. Figure out with your time, your talent, and your treasure, are you giving God what he deserves? If you are, you will be blessed. You will have the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life. You will have peace. And I pray this week that God's peace and joy would fill you, that charis, that, that grace that only comes from the Lord. Father God, we thank you for your word. And thank you, God, for leading us uh, on that amazing journey through the book of Philippians. God, we ask that you would show us what book to study next. Lord, that you would bless every family represented here. Lord, for the single people, God, I pray that you would give them, Lord, just grace to be patient until you bring their, their soulmate, that one that you want them to spend their life with. Lord, just give them the ability to maintain that chaste, uh, pure spirit about them. Lord, for the married couples, God, I pray that you would heal marriages. Lord, we know that as we serve you, the enemy tries to break up families. So, God, we pray that you would heal marriages this morning. God, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit and that we would truly experience that charis, that, that grace, that joy that fills our heart, that joy unspeakable. Lord, may all we do this week be pleasing unto you and bring glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week, and uh, we'll see you at the Zoom study or next Sunday.